let's turn it over to Dr. Tulia for the live exam. So foot and ankle exam uh, is really crucial. Um, and thankfully, it's one that can be done relatively quickly. So we're going to go through kind of a basic foot and ankle exam that you can do with pretty much everyone. And then we're going to go through a few kind of specialty tests that you don't have to do everyone. You certainly can, uh, but you should really reserve for times that are that are uh, important. And so the first thing that I'll do when patients are in there, I often will, my patients are often seated. So the first thing I'll do is just kind of look and inspect. And now if, when people come in and, and talk to me about where their pain is, I'll often have them point to a specific area of their foot that is painful. One of the things that happens in the foot and ankle exam is people are often facing you. Um, and so things that can get missed are things that are behind you or underneath. So usually the first part of most physical exams is just observation. So you just look, see if there's open sores, swelling, um, you know, lesions of any kind. The other thing that I will typically do when people are seated is I will actually look at the bottom of their feet. The bottom of the feet can often tell the story because calluses in certain areas can show where there's abnormal wear. Also, we don't want to miss open sores, lesions, infections, you know, those types of things. All right, and just relax right there. So first part, inspection there. Next part, what I'll typically have people do is range of motion and kind of partial strength. So I'll have people slightly bend their knee. I'll ask them to pick up towards yourself and push down. Good. Go in that way and out that way. What this is showing me is tibialis anterior, gastrocnemius, tibialis posterior, and peroneus brevis. What it's also showing me is range of motion of the tibiotalar joint and their subtalar joint. So usually have them do that themselves. Then I'll have them relax and say, just relax. And I will usually try to make those motions myself to see, move their joints, both their tibiotalar joint and their subtalar joint. I will typically also move their big toe and their small toes as well. Again, trying to evaluate those range of motions and everything else. Um, next, I will typically feel their pulses. We're feeling the dorsalis pedis pulse and the tibialis posterior. Making sure that they're equal. Now, we'll usually ask people, do you have any numbness or tingling anywhere? No. And I'll ask, and then we'll go through just a quick, you know, sensational light touch exam. Feel that touching there. And there, 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 feel equal underneath here too. Mm -hmm. So superficial perineal, deep perineal, surl, saphenous, and then tibial underneath. All right. Um, <clears throat> and the last thing we'll do is typically ask in strength. You already do range of motion. So pick up full toward yourself and hold real strong. Good. And push down. Good in that way. Good. Out that way. Good. All right. Good. Next thing we'll do is test for ankle instability. And so ankle instability is can be a little, little bit of a subtle test. It's one that is very good to do on a lot of people so you get an understanding of how people are. And so I was going to just relax. So the first thing we're going to test is what is the ATFL. So what I'll do is I will cup their uh, tibio in one hand. Uh, cupping around usually with two fingers. I'll have my thumb right at the joint line. I'll have my other thumb on the talus underneath, two fingers in the back on the calcaneus. You want to plantar flex to about 10 or 20 degrees. And now you're trying to just anteriorly translate the foot beyond. Usually the nice part about using your thumbs, you can kind of get a sense of how much it's moving or not. And really there's little to no motion here. To test the CFL, we'll do a Taylor tilt. Again, relax for me. You'll have the foot at 90 degrees, and then you will just tilt. And the easiest way, again, to do this is to have your thumbs there and to just use it to try and tilt, and you can kind of get that assessment of kind of where your thumbs are. This is for ankle sprains and instability. Remember, we talked about the ATFL being the most common ligament that's sprained, CFL being the other one. You can often kind of palpate and, and uh, find tenderness at the ATFL. The CFL is very tough uh, to feel because it's underneath the perineals. Um, in terms of evaluating for the syndesmosis, the most sensitive test is what we call the squeeze test. So the squeeze test, apologies. Um, what I'll usually do is try to get people to relax. I'll try to have them kind of dorsiflex their foot up. 
When you dorsiflex the foot, it'll bring the large part of the talus into the syndesmosis. And then I will squeeze. And you wanna squeeze up high. And what you're doing is you're pushing the tibia and the fibula together. When you push the tibia and the fibula together, it should irritate the interosseous ligament that runs down here. A positive squeeze test, if you have concern for a high ankle sprain, is not pain where you're pushing, it's pain that shoots down to the ankle right along here. And that's the positive squeeze test. The other one that can be helpful in this regard is similarly doing what we call dorsiflexion and external rotation. And so you can kind of pick the foot up and try to externally rotate them and see if that causes pain as well. The squeeze is the most sensitive. It's not terribly specific, unfortunately, but certainly the most sensitive. <clears throat> okay. And then the most crucial one generally is the Achilles test. And so when you're evaluating the Achilles, the best way to do it is to have someone lie on their stomach. So if you're able to lie on your stomach, that would be helpful. And so <clears throat> when evaluating an acute Achilles, the Thompson test is the crucial thing. So the Thompson test really simple. You want to have them relax as best they can. And what you'll observe here is what we call resting tone. So people will generally have a resting tone that's a little bit plantar flex and everyone's can be a little bit different. The nice part about most people is they have two feet. And so you really should be examining both their injured side and their non-injured side. I usually do everything we're talking about on the non-injured side first before going to the injured side. And for the Achilles, this can be really crucial especially for old lesions, because when people have a chronic rupture, their resting tone might be down a bit compared to the other side. But when you squeeze, because it started to heal, you may actually get a response. And so you may get fooled with an old rupture. In the acute setting, typically their resting tone will be gone. They'll have a palpable gap somewhere within the tendon. And then when you squeeze, you don't get this nice brisk response. And you can see equal and normal, and this is very easy. And that's what makes the Thompson so nice, is it's fairly easy to um, uh, perform, and it's basically pathognomonic as things go. All right, maybe stand back up. We have you guys come around here. Same. I'll have you stand up, yeah. And so the last part of the exam, or the first part of the exam, depending on what happens, and really depending on kind of if the patient's standing when you come in the room or the patient's sitting is I'll have someone stand and observe them. And so again, what you want to do when you're observing here is you want to see alignment. So you want to look at the arch. Um, you want to look at the hind foot alignment, the forefoot alignment, see if there's anything out of alignment, because there are certain things that while sitting won't look that bad, but while standing, people will move and shift. And you really want to make sure you're looking at people from the front and then I'll have them turn around and turn around if you wouldn't mind and looking at people from the back. And when you look at people from the back, the normal position, you can look at the Achilles and they'll usually have about three to five degrees of valgus. But some people will be neutral or even a in a little bit of varus. And obviously there's some variation just anatomically of how people are. The other thing that we typically would like people to do, and it's a little bit tough here, is they'll usually have people do a single limb heel rise. Usually we'll have them do it holding their balance against the wall if you're able to do single limb. Nice. And what you'll see here is that though he has a bit of a flat foot, when he goes up onto his heel, he will recreate his arch. And that's a very appropriate thing. So that's what we want to see. In order to do that, the muscles of the hind foot have to work. It also shows that the tibialis posterior tendon is working well. And then the last part of the exam is just having people walk. So same thing, I will have people walk away from me just for three or four steps and then walk back towards me. Good. And, and so what you're seeing there is you wanna have, some people will have some dynamic problems or deformities, again, that won't necessarily manifest themselves because gait and ambulation is such a dynamic thing that requires a lot of coordination. There can be things that are a little bit off. So all of this kind of encompasses the exam. So it's inspection, it's palpation, it's strength, neuro exam, vascular exam, um, and then these kind of special tests for a lot of uh, these specific things that are thankfully not too bad. Remember that almost everyone will have a good second limb that you can examine and will be their normal. And so whenever possible, make sure that you're having them wear shorts. They have both of those limbs exposed so you can examine that um, 
normal side first. Also, the more opportunity you get to do this, the more normals you get to see, the more of an ability you'll have when the abnormals come in to say, okay, this is a little abnormal from the, all the normal patients that I've seen come through. Um, so that's your basic foot exam, uh, an ankle exam with some specialty tests going in. But thankfully, a good foot and ankle exam should take you maybe two minutes. Uh, you can do it really thoroughly and effectively. Um, with that, I will take uh, questions if there are any. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Tulier. We do have a couple of questions. Um, is someone who has had an Achilles tendon rupture uh, considered at higher risk for a contralateral Achilles rupture? Yes, they are. Um, you're actually about 200 more times more likely than the general population, but the risk of rupture on the other side is only about 3%. So still 97% will not get a contralateral, but you're much higher than the general population. So the answer, unfortunately, is yes. The reason for that, as you might imagine, is whatever process of micro tearing or whatever else was going on in one tendon, you assume is probably going on, you know, in the in the other tendon. And so you are at an increased risk of contralateral rupture. All right. Another question is, where do you palpate the ATFL? If yeah, you can show that. Good question. So if you can zoom in here, so the ATFL runs on the anterior and very distal portion of the fibula right here. So it runs right here and then runs along down onto the tailor neck right here. So usually when you're palpating the ATFL, it's right in between the two, right in that spot. This is why when we talk about the Ottawa ankle rules and they talk about tenderness along the fibula in the Ottawa rules, it's actually specifically the posterior fibula you're supposed to palpate for question of a fracture because people who have sprains will usually be tender right there. And that's, that's the ATFL. The uh, two perineals are running right down here. So you really cannot palpate the CFL. You can push on the perineals, but it doesn't really get you to that spot. Admittedly, deep to this is also where the lateral process of the talus is. And so that's hard to palpate. I did not talk about it, but right here is the anterior process of the calcaneus. And this actually usually you can palpate. So this is a good area, you know, if people are having pain in this region, you want to distinguish, is it pain ATFL here, or is it pain anterior process of the calcaneus, which is typically down there? And you can usually feel that bony prominence. It's kind of covered by uh, the EDB here, but it's usually palpable and prominent there. Um, and so it's a good thing that if you have some tenderness there, be really cognizant of your radiographs and potentially ordering other imaging as well. So yeah, good question. So we've got a couple of questions regarding how to examine for tarsal tunnel. Mm, yeah, yeah, good question. So tarsal tunnel, uh, did not talk about. Uh, so tarsal tunnel is an entrapment of the tibial nerve as it goes through the tarsal tunnel in the back. Um, a lot of things can cause tarsal tunnel, similar to the carpal tunnel, um, swelling, uh, cysts, uh, benign tumors, <laughs> non-benign tumors. Um, it's a relatively rare diagnosis, but um, uh, one that can be hard to figure out. And so in terms of tarsal tunnel, the things that first thing you want to do is one, you want to have that neuro exam. So the tarsal tunnel, the tibial nerve runs along here, the tibialis posterior tendon, the flexor digitorum longus, then there is the neurovascular bundle and FHL, they run along the back. And the, the nerve runs in between typically the FDL and the FHL on the back. And so in terms of evaluating for tarsal tunnel, you want to do a few things. One, you want to actually make sure that their sensation is intact um, in the medial plantar, the lateral plantar, and the medial calcaneal branch, because there are three major branches of the tibial nerve once it crosses through the tarsal tunnel. Um, I will often have people also try and spread out their toes. So if you spread out your toes, it's the intrinsic muscles of your foot. Um, the intrinsic muscles of your foot can sometimes be uh, not working well. Um, what I will tell you, and you will find out, is not everyone is able to do this well. And so that's why you want to have them do it on, on both sides. And you're valuing for bilateral. It's a little bit problematic. And then so the other typical thing that we'll do is we'll look for a tenels. And so what you want to do is kind of look for a tenels along the path of the nerve down as it runs down here. So the nerve will run deep in here. And all you're doing is tapping the nerve and seeing if it kind of sends that zinging sensation down. It's definitely not a perfect test. 
Um, so what you're looking for, again, loss of sensation, loss of strength, and these can be quite subtle. Um, and then a positive tunnels in that area. Certainly, you know, similar to carpal tunnel, but not as um, salient is that's where an EMG will be really helpful for you and kind of determining if that's the case. Uh, but it can be a little tougher to do. But in terms of exam, that's what you're doing. So you're looking for sensation, you're looking for strength in that uh, tibial nerve, um, and then you're looking for a tunnels directly over the tarsal tunnel, which is posterior medial to the medial malleolus down in here, trying to see if you can zing it. And oftentimes what I will do is I will try to see if I can find their posterior tib pulse because the artery and the nerve run right next to each other. And so the pulse is right there and I will go right next to that spot. That typically is your best, although admittedly, sometimes you're just kind of moving around because you don't know exactly where that nerve is. So we have a question. Can you demonstrate sinus tarsi evaluation? Sinus tarsi evaluation. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, sinus, tarsi. sinus tarsi, yeah. So the sinus tarsi is a uh, an area. Um, it's an anatomic region. So the, the sinus tarsi, move your foot this way. Uh, the sinus tarsi is a you know, the hole basically uh, that runs and it runs in the um, subtalar joint. So it runs between your talus and your calcaneus. The subtalar, the sinus tarsi is right here. So when people talk about sinus tarsi syndrome, which is pain within that area, um, your palpation is right here in the sinus, in the sinus tarsi. So it's kind of, you can feel this kind of gap fall in it's right around where ATFL is. And then the fun part about this is ATFL is right here. Sinus tarsi runs just underneath it right there anterior process of the calcaneus is right here. Your perineals are right here. So a number of things that are all within this spot that will commonly cause pain. And so, yeah, tenderness in the sinus tarsi could be a sign of sinus tarsi syndrome. Um, a lot of times people who have a flat foot will get impingement in their sinus tarsi, not to mention subtalar arthritis and some other things too. So I wouldn't say there's a great, uh, physical exam, but that's where the sinus tarsi is located. And so tenderness there could be a concern for that. Although sinus tarsi syndrome is often more of a historical and uh, imaging diagnosis as well. Okay. One person had a question. Can an old ankle injury cause edema years down the road? Um, yes. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the short answer is yes. Uh, any, unfortunately, any ankle injury, surgery, fractures, everything else, sometimes the venous and lymphatic system can kind of get overwhelmed. As we know, the venous and lymphatic system is a one, are one-way valve systems. As we get older, and especially if there's major injury where there's a lot of swelling at one point in time, those systems may or may not go back to their original compliance. So we do see a lot of people who will have one major injury, be it fracture, um, you know, major soft tissue injury or surgery. And especially as people get older where their swelling never really truly gets better. And so the answer is, yeah, sometimes one injury bad enough can kind of overwhelm that system to where it doesn't ever truly get back to its original compliancy. And people can have issues with edema, even unilaterally kind of forever and need compression socks and some other things that help with that. And so, uh, one question, um, when do you prescribe custom orthotics and for what indications? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, uh, it's a very highly controversial and debatable answer. So in, in the broad strokes, orthotics do two things. They do cushioning and they do mild deformity correction. And so, uh, and they are almost always trial and error and they can be very expensive trial and error. Um, so it's certainly something to think about when you, when you are prescribing them is that what's the, you know, social and financial situation of the patient and their ability to potentially get them. So typically when I'm prescribing, um, custom orthotics is for people who have a unique foot that I am trying to give them a, uh, mild deformity correction. That's usually someone with a flat foot that we're trying to actually raise up their arm. Um, sometimes people have a really cavus foot. You can get kind of an opposite orthotic for that. The other people that I prescribe custom orthotics to all the time are my neuropathics because that's a protective um, thing. 
you're getting them a protective orthotic to really protect them from ulcerations and other things within their feet. And that is really crucial. The nice part about that is insurance usually will pay for that. But it is fair to warn people, orthotics are very much trial and error and they often need to be modified. They don't always work the way that we want them to. And so I'm, I'm fairly judicious in who I, I give them to. And a lot of people will do reasonably well with over-the-counter ones that are one-tenth of the cost. All right. Here's a good question. Any tips on distinguishing ordinary plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis from that related to spondyloarthropathy? Uh, yeah, an EMG. <laughs> I mean, to be quite honest, uh, what, what will happen a lot, admittedly, in my practice, is people that have people will have recalcitrant heel pain that just does not respond to the anti-inflammatories, the injections, kind of the other things. And when things aren't responding to the normal treatment, that's where I'm often getting an EMG or imaging of their spine to see if there's some other component that's there. And that, that's not infrequent. And so usually it's, it can be real hard, honestly. You know, your exam can be non-distinct sometimes. Obviously, people won't have, you have people who have numbness or tingling or weakness, you're going to worry about a neurologic problem. But that isn't always the case. And so you can certainly get people who have impingement, lumbar radiculopathy, and other things that will get plantar foot pain, where that is kind of the inciting symptom and the one problem. And so for me, it's usually people who are not responding to the other treatments. You want to rule those things out. So in terms of physical exam to do, you know, a good neuro exam, a good strength exam, making sure there's not something else concomitant, straight leg raise, all the things you're looking for to evaluate for lumbar radiculopathy, you know, seeing if they're directly tender to palpation directly over their plantar fascia might say, I'm oh, more likely plantar fascia than something else. But we all know patients don't read the textbooks. And so um, th things can come in and be very vague. And, you know, I have a low threshold when people aren't getting better with treatment to get an EMG or imaging in their spine just to make sure that's not there. And, and any tips if it's rheumatologic enthesopathies, like they're getting like bilateral plantar fasciitis, multiple tendinopathies, something that you might peel off? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, obviously multiple joints in multiple areas is always a, is always a question of, uh, oftentimes people will have bilateral Achilles tendinitis or plantar fasciitis. That's not unusual when you're having multiple joints, obviously, you know, overlying erythema, psoriasis, you know, skin lesions and that sort of things, um, can be there kind of swelling out of proportion to what you think would be normal are there, but it's often a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, you know, when you, again, when you've kind of run through the treatments, when the imaging is negative, those sorts of things, that's where you start to think about that more often. All right. So I think there aren't any other questions, but no, thanks here. Dr. Tullier. Yeah, that was fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you everybody. Uh, good day. And uh, I'll let Francais.